What if you could play D&D whenever you wanted? No worrying about which players could or couldn't make it? No obsessive amounts of prep? No worrying about plot lines or even entire campaigns falling apart? This may sound a little too good to be true, but this style of campaign really does exist. It's commonly referred to as a West Marches style campaign. So just in case this is a new term for you, I'll go over what a West Marches campaign entails, some of the potential issues they can have and how to fix them, and also how you can take any pre-existing linear campaigns that you might want to run, such as the ever-popular Curse of Strahd, and make it work for a West Marches inspired game instead. So what is a West Marches campaign? At their core, West Marches are campaigns with episodic style sessions and open table play. The first official West Marches was created by game designer Ben Robbins. He also happens to be the creator of both Microscope and Kingdom, which are two really fun world building games. If you haven't tried them yet, I'll link to them below. But West Marches was created as a campaign with no regular set schedule, no regular set playgroup, and no regular set plot. And while this can sound crazy, these three elements get rid of a lot of things that can stop D&D campaigns from you know, actually happening. With the style campaign, there's no more canceling a game just because someone couldn't make it, or having to reschedule because you had an insane amount of prep to make that particular session work. And because there's no set party, you can have an entire roster of potential players, which means no more feeling like a huge jerk when you can't include everyone. So what does running a West Marches campaign actually look like? First, four to six players from your roster get together and decide what group, they're gonna play what type of mission with, and when they're gonna do it. The OG West Marches campaign had an email list, but I think your players would prefer something like a Discord server for their campaign. Trust. Next, they contact you so you can prep and run said session. Then they post their session notes for everybody who wasn't able to attend that session and update the map with the things that they found. And that's it. Rinse and repeat. Now. If some of you raised an eyebrow when I mentioned certain things such as the players scheduling their games, you, like me, may have a few bones to pick with the West Marches style campaign as well. So what are some of these potential pitfalls that West Marches campaigns can have and how do we prevent them? For a true West Marches, the players pick their session group, what they'd like to do in their session, and they tell you when they would like to have their session scheduled. And for me personally, I'd really prefer to have a little bit more control in this area. I'd rather choose to offer up potential dates for play. That way you don't have the frustration of the back and forth. Does this date work? No. How about this? No. Not to mention that if you control the flow, you won't feel the pressure of either over scheduling yourself to accommodate everyone or the disappointment of still having too little play if your players just aren't as proactive about scheduling as you. And this doesn't have to be complicated. Just sending out a message in the Discord at the beginning of the week with your availability for play or something similar seems like a really reasonable way to kick off planning for the week. And that way players can see who else is planning on being at the table. So all they really have to do is decide what they'd like to focus their energies on so you can prep it. One of the other potential pitfalls I see with this style of campaign is that little cliques might form, and this can leave some people feeling left out. And I definitely see it being an issue with people that truly do want to play, but who again might just not be as proactive or assertive about scheduling sessions. Before play even starts, I think I'd emphasize the fact that I want everybody to get a chance to play with everybody else in the group and let them know that some sessions I might be extending first choice of seats to people who don't get to play as often. And you absolutely could just wing it and make sure to choose a bunch of different times and days to accommodate differing schedules. I just know for me personally, I would hate for anyone to feel excluded. So I'd plan on keeping a kind of rough kind of attendance. That way I can make sure everybody at least felt like they had the chance to play even if their schedule wasn't accommodating it. Another thing I wouldn't necessarily count on is super proactive note-taking from all of your players. And this is definitely group dependent, but there's a reason some of us are GMs and some of us aren't. And workload is definitely part of it. I really like that Ben awards healing potions, extra inspiration, extra gold, and all of that sort of stuff to help incentivize note posting. So that's definitely something you should also plan on. I think players definitely need a little extra incentive to put in that type of extra work, but I think you should definitely also plan on adding little amendments if they miss something important. I know some GMs are fine with penalizing players for missing certain information because they should have paid better attention, 
but that's very easy for you to say when you're the one creating the game and know what information's important. By the way, the OG West March's campaign notes are supposed to be written in character, and I feel like that's also a restriction I might remove. I love the idea, but if I want my players to actually do the thing, I think this is another potential barrier if players don't feel like they're creative enough to do it that way. Another thing I don't personally enjoy when I'm GMing is running mixed level groups, and that's another feature of West March's campaign groups is having people at different levels depending on how much time they've had to play. And this might not bug you, but I think a potential barrier to play could be a level 2 paladin wanting to play with his level 8 barbarian buddy. With that big of a gap, somebody is probably going to not have the best time. And sure, there are ways to deal with this, but the allure of a West March's style campaign to me is partially the ease of running it for the GM as well as the ease of playing in it. I think using group leveling makes it a lot easier for people to just jump in where they can. You know, instead of penalizing them for not having the same amount of time and energy to dedicate to their group's game of make-believe. This still incentivizes play in reaching milestones as a whole without penalizing the individual. And if someone is brand new to D&D and might need that lower level play to learn the ropes, I'd probably ask a few other players to join in on some initiation adventures to kind of help them get a hang of it. This could also open the door to other players who are potentially interested in running several different characters. That way they can experiment with different classes and subclass combinations and get used to those features too. So those were just little pitfalls that I thought might cause a West March's campaign to fall a little flat for my groups. And even though there are features that I would change just because I think they'd suit my group's needs better, the thing I truly love about West March's campaigns is that they're player-led, and I really wanted to emphasize this about this process. I think a great idea for this style of campaign is having a Discord server with a suggestion board, and that way it's a lot easier for the other players and you to kind of see where the interest in the story lays. But it also gives you a chance to notice who's a little bit on the quieter side, and who might need a little more help and space to get in there and get playing. But my biggest issue with the West Marches campaign is actually one of the main features that people are attracted to. A West Marches is basically a sandbox without cities and without significant NPCs. But social encounters are actually a huge part of what makes D&D fun for me and for my players. A big part of why they do away with this is because this style of campaign is solely built around the idea of exploring the unknown wilderness around this safe frontier village. In fact, a popular adventure to build a West Marches campaign around is Goodman Games Into the Borderlands, which will actually be getting a WotC revamp soon for the 2025 starter set. So, can we take all these things we really liked about a West March's campaign and create our own bastardized version, complete with towns and NPCs and maybe even a sprinkling of plot? We can certainly try, folks! For this example, I'm going to use Curse of Strahd because it's finally spooky season, and it's always spooky season in my heart. So warning, there will be light spoilers, watch at your own peril. But you can also take all these guidelines and apply them to Princes of the Apocalypse or Icewind Dale or any other linear campaign that you're interested in playing. So I think the essential elements you'd need to run a more episodic, decentralized campaign similar to a West Marches include I like the fact that nothing exciting is supposed to happen here. It's just where the PCs spend their time between adventures. The idea is to push them out to explore. For Curse of Strahd, I'd have this be the ruins of the village of Barovia after Irina and Ismark have left. And I like this starting spot in particular because there are a lot of potential plot hooks to start your party off on, as well as a few reasons they might be amassed here. Like I said before, one of the greatest parts of a West March's campaign is that it teaches your players how to be a lot more proactive. But you're still going to have to help them out by giving them a strong start, even with this style of campaign. One of the ways I like to get my players into more of a proactive mindset 
is by giving them character creation guidelines that help highlight why they might all be here together, even if they don't personally know each other yet. And for something as decentralized as a West Marches campaign, you'll want to keep it super simple. One of the reasons your PCs could be banded together in the ruins of this town is because they're all part of a recently assembled outpost of the Velaki rebels. Since they're new recruits after seeing the horrors that Strahd can bring down upon them, this would be a great chance to push them towards adventures having to do with Velaki, as well as some of the political intrigue there. Another easy one is that they're simply town survivors after all of this. With this one, they could have just barely survived the wave of horrors that Strahd brought down upon them. And so you can implement some hooks with potential undead, werewolves, blights, that sort of thing. They can even be Vistani guests who've recently left one of the camps. Maybe they're uncomfortable now after seeing what the Vistani are willing to tolerate for rights in and out of the mists around Barovia. And one that I think would be a lot of fun for higher level play would be having them all be former Strahd con sorts. I think playing a group of scorned lovers seeking revenge would be such a blast. Next you'll need a basic map. And so if you're starting in the ruins of the village like I would, I would have only a super rough map. Like yes, people know the names of a bunch of different places, but Barovia isn't built for travelers. So I don't think it's crazy for a bunch of characters to know how to reach a place, but not necessarily know what to expect until they get a bit closer. That way, as groups of players learn things, they can add their own symbols and notes to the map, updating as they see fit. And you could also start it off smaller if you wanted to. Maybe the average person in town would only have a map that went as far as Velaki. And again, a traditional West Marches doesn't include towns, but the idea of not having them is silly to me. I consider urban exploration to still be exploration, and I think it's something that still drives adventure, especially in this case where we're talking about Curse of Strahd. Just because there are towns does not make them safe. And like I said earlier, one of the great joys of D&D, to me at least, is playing social encounters. So your mileage may vary, but I'm not cutting cities and NPCs out of this. One of the harder parts of trying to run a game like this with plot elements is going to be learning how to run sessions that are more episodic in nature. You're going to want little chunks of story that are essentially one shots, sometimes two episodes. So you're really going to want to channel your inner Buffy, Xena, X-Files type of mentality. So we're going to want to structure our story ideas to emphasize exploration, as well as maybe something like paving the way for Strahd to be defeated, if that's what your PCs actually want to do, which I'll get to in a second. So I'd focus on creating potential hooks that lead to the different groups in your larger campaign, learning about and collecting different magic items that are related to Strahd and his ilk, or even on fleshing out additional ideas using Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft. That way you can kind of extend play if you want to. This just isn't going to look the same as kind of that linear checklist of a lot of published campaigns. So the players might find themselves in over their heads in certain areas, and then they'll have to mark them on the map as something to come back to later, or certain bigger plot concepts might not really become more apparent until they've played through more episodes. But you really want to make sure you're running these in a way where the story can naturally emerge over these different sessions of play, adding up over time. And this goes hand in hand with my last tip for turning a traditional linear campaign into more of the sandboxy, episodic, West Marches inspired type. And this tip is about paring down and decentralizing the story. And this could be a whole video's worth of information on its own. So let me know in the comments if a video on emergent and decentralized story is something you guys are into. But what does this even mean? The reason I use Curse of Strahd as the example for this is because that shit is notoriously dense. There's a lot of material in there. And also a lot of story that builds on top of everything as the players move through Barovia. But you can also just take a lot of that information, that plot, and deliver it in a ton of different ways. If your players are looking to defeat Strahd, they don't necessarily have to go get a Taroka reading. It might be a lot more fun to drip certain information to them through a forest crawl, or through certain NPC interactions once they reach certain cities. Or it might turn out all of your players are super indistraught and by episode 10 they don't want to kill them at all. There are still tons of adventures you can run in this type of setting with them being his lackeys or his enforcers. And who knows, 
they might end up having a change of heart yet again. All this to say is you can use these linear campaign guides as just that, guides and rough ones at that. I'd really consider them more like inspiration sources that just help you provide the most fun possible for your group and whatever style of play they're looking for. Again, this is about our super proactive PCs. Doing this will help you pare down the story to its most core element. With Curse of Strahd, the storyline at its very heart is that Strahd will stop at nothing to marry Irene. With that in mind, you can see how little of everything else needs to be predetermined in order to provide your players with a good story. Again, your PCs might want to attend a grand wedding, but this also helps you in terms of prep, because all you have to think about is how would I be moving this emerging story closer to its end? That's the main question you have to ask every time you plan a session. Because even if your PCs aren't interacting directly with Irina or Ismark or even Strahd, the world around them is still happening. This also lets you drip information to them pretty much wherever they are. I talk a lot about Mike Shea's lazy DM prep list, just learning to jot down secrets and clues that your PCs need to know in order for there to be a story to kind of follow along. Doing it that way makes it so easy to get that information to them. If they need to know about where ravens in the area, they can see a pile of clothes on the ground. They can recall hearing a weird rumor back in town. You can find a weird trail of feathers that lead somewhere, etc, etc, etc. Dripping information in this manner can absolutely make it feel like there's a more cohesive story for your players. And if you kind of combine these ideas of paring down the story and decentralizing it, I think it'd be really cool to kind of see what the players start to pick up as you get more episodes into the campaign. Because remember, they'll have these notes going, so they'll be able to read through it and start piecing things together. I think it'd be super fun. So let me know in the comments how you feel about running games this way. I'm a big fan of more narrative-heavy, linear campaign styles, but I feel like this has potential and I can't wait to try it out.